Um, well, thanks everyone for uh, joining again. Um, I'm making some good progress on the booking spec. Oh, well, I haven't been here for the last couple of weeks because with the commitments, uh, I've been kept up to date by Nick. Um, so I'm glad to see that things are uh, progressing and we've got to get close to having a 1.0 spec done. So in terms of agenda for today, um, let me just get the slides up. There we go, you can see that. Um, so there are some, as Nick circulated in the, his email earlier this week, uh, there's a few things that we wanna uh, cover as discussion points today. All right, some specific areas of the spec that are, uh, we've had some feedback and discussion around. Um, run through, well, again, what the MVP implementation looks like, uh, and then just uh, briefly the kind of key dates coming up over the next few weeks to try and get this over the line. Um, I'm going to defer to Nick to take us through um, the kind of detailed discussion, because um, he's been involved in those more directly. Um, so, as usual, jump in with questions and comments as we go. Uh, Nick, do you want to... Jump yeah, in. sure. Um, so I, I'm hoping that uh, at some point in this call, uh, there's two people who have said they're going to join in order to discuss one of the points on here. Uh, if they don't join, then uh, I'm going to, oh, I don't know if I can be three people trying to represent everyone, uh, but um, we'll, we'll, we'll see, play that by ear. So that's the approval flow, and that's the last on the list for that reason. So with any luck, uh, we'll, they'll, they'll appear, but they might have got held up or uh, something change plans. Okay, so um, the uh, I guess first of all, before we get into the discussion points, um, I don't know if anyone has anything they would, I mean, I know Shoaib, you've been kind of looking at it from Legend's perspective and kind of getting into the detail of that. Um, Phil and, and Ian on the call, I know that you both from Gladstone's perspective been, um, been kind of Look, we, we went through that in a, in a, in a, in a meeting last week and uh, kind of covered the high level points of what the spec was about. Um, so I don't know if anyone has any um, any questions from that specifically uh, before we we kind of cover these points off. Silence means either that the, the microphones aren't working or that there is actually no problems. And we should. Uh, hi, Nick. Yeah. So I've been looking into the spec and. Uh, I will probably send you an email about some points. I mean, there are some things which we, I mean, it's complex. I mean, we need to do some, quite a lot of work. So we will, I mean, I'll, I'll have to send you some list of questions and see and, and discuss in detail some of the things. But at the moment, uh, I don't have anything to raise. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that, sure, that, that works. No problem. No, nothing um, from me either, Nick, really. We know we're not really any further on than last Friday. We haven't really looked at it into any more great depths than we had at that point uh hoping to get a bit more time this week okay great thank you phil um no problem at all so um okay in that case let's get into the um some of the content of this then uh so access control uh is the first point um i don't know if you're able to to get the booking spec up there lee uh and uh, just just go to the access control section as lee's already pointed out Access control is probably not the best name for it. I think it's like 8.11 or something. I actually have no idea. I just made that up. Um, somewhere down there, keep going. 8. Point, no, 8.7, 7.11. No. Um, so, so we've had some discussions around access control, um, but not, not brought them to this group. I think that's fair to say. We haven't had a detailed conversation here. Um, and uh, and so that that is the purpose of this bringing this little bit to, to light for everybody um, and uh, what, what this means access control this isn't a kind of database level access uh, at least pointed out the naming is probably not ideal so it'd be interesting to hear what you guys call it um, but in just in terms of um, so I know that, that for example in club spark you you can get provided by with a pin code which you use to enter uh, a particular tennis court or that type of thing, uh, which might be um, not manned uh, at a weekend or even in the day. I know that at, um, uh, at leisure operator sites, that there is also sometimes there's turnstiles that you can use a QR code or a, or a barcode to get through. 
Um, and there also are the receptionists who will need to understand uh, that they can let someone through as well. So there's that kind of angle too. Um, and so uh, what, what we try to do with this access control stuff here really is provide the, a variety of options for um, that kind of proof of purchase um, being machine readable, but also human readable so that you can, you can get into the site basically when you, um, um, when you actually have your ticket if it's a mobile ticket or if you print it out. Um, so in the, in the conversation with Gladstone on Friday, uh, it was raised a really good point around uh, particular IDs in the Gladstone system that you would need to be able to present to a reg receptionist in order to, to gain access. Um, and that actually shone a light on that the current access control stuff we had, which was really very rough and as more of an extension, really wasn't sufficient for even basic access. Um, so I can I, I'll just quickly take you through the three types of access control we've got in here, and then it would be great to hear from you guys um, whether that you think that covers. Um, I, I know um, uh, Jamie and Tommy, you've obviously got experience across a lot of broader operators as well that you're working with. So um, and Siv, so that would be really good. Um, so access control, the three types we've got here: text-based access control, which is a pin code or a booking reference. These are human readable. Uh, properties so this is the idea is that we've got a name and description kind of pair that you can use and you can supply multiple of these and the idea being that in a different system or in a different setting you might call it something different so um, it might be a member ID in one place a booking reference somewhere it might be a pin code in some place so you can you can call it what you want that's related to the system and then the broker can display that as a pin code and then the actual the actual number um, so that's text-based, so name description, uh, and hopefully that's kind of clear. Do you want questions as you go, or? Well, if I just cover, if I cover the next two, and then um, we all, so image-based, very similar to that, except it's an image. Uh, this is for if you wanted to provide a, a, a pre-rendered uh, barcode or a QR code, you could just put that in and exactly the same uh, as the previous, um, and then, uh, the extension point is to allow for rendering of barcodes. So there are barcode libraries available. If you tell them it's a code 128 barcode and there's the number and a certain other information, you can actually render that barcode out and do that live. Um, there are advantages to doing that um, versus using a PNG that's being rendered on the server. So I don't know which will be where we'll see the uptake across both. So this is currently included as an extension point. Originally, that was all that was there, but we've added the previous two. So there's now an image and text option. Um, so yeah, so that's the kind of brief. So I don't know, yeah, I guess the, yeah, if you had any questions or what do you guys think? So one of the things I was gonna say is that um, it, it, would, it seems like generally uh, having an, a booking reference or order ID would be common across systems, even if you don't need to present that in order to access a facility or get through a barrier or something. So, so my question was, is why wouldn't the booking reference be the order ID? You know, why wouldn't that be baked? Why wouldn't we be using that to uniquely identify things elsewhere or include it elsewhere in the data model rather than as a kind of code? The reference right so there's currently there is a in the model if you go to on the left hand side if you go to order item uh, you'll see that there is a uh, what is it called there's something in here uh, order no sorry actually if you go to order it's an order level I think there's a reference for the order You've got schema identifier uh, order number which is schema order number. Okay. So, so there's a reference for the order, but the access codes are at an order item level. So if you have multiple people, they could get each their own pin code or their own barcodes uh, is how it's currently set up. So per, uh, so there's an item, there's a, an item per purse per order. And then that's, uh, so if there's three, if you've asked for three places in a yoga class, you'll get three items. And then, therefore, you could supply three access codes. Okay. Uh, so that we, looks good to me. By the way, those three options. We use uh, the reference number. 
uh, at the moment, but it's good to have the flexibility. What do you think, Phil? Does this cover, and, and Ian, does this cover our discussion on Friday in terms of um, what, what you'd want to see from Gladstone's perspective in there that would make sense for your customers? Well, I think so, but as I say, we haven't really gone into it in that great detail yet since Friday. We haven't had that much time to uh, to examine it great, in great detail. I mean, it seems reasonable, but I'd like to reserve final judgment until I've had time to think about it a little bit more. Okay. Uh, and 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 show up. Do you do you um, from Legends' perspective? How do you how does it work with barcodes and numbers? Yeah, currently, when somebody makes a booking. Uh, and we just, if we send him an email, then we would include a barcode inside the email that member can uh, act, uh, either print or just uh, just take it to the reception. And then using that barcode, you can just uh, swipe or mm -hmm. just, just get entry into the system. Mm -hmm. So this is how we work. So booking reference, we don't use booking reference for uh, entry. So it will be barcode for us. Okay, and what if the barcode fails to scan at reception? What what is the backup that they use? Well, well, I don't know from operational point of view, but uh, I think they, I think the member can just uh, just pass the detail of the session they're about to attend, and then the receptionist then can open that session and see what email address they used for booking, and then can verify some details and let them through. Yeah, that makes sense. So uh, register and check the register. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. And that, that's interesting as well because it, it's a, like it shows that it's not always booking reference that's uh, a thing. Yeah, we never use booking reference at all. For our online ticketing, it's always we always issue a barcode to the member uh, whoever is booking and then he has to present the barcode to enter into the club. Perfect. Okay. Well, that sounds good. And I know that um, on the Gladstone side that there's, they have the same um, register that you, you can use and, and, and check the email in the same way. So that sounds like it probably is parallel um, there. Okay. Um, does anyone else, uh, Sib or Tom, anyone have any ideas on this or are we all good with it? Seems to make sense. Those three options from my perspective. I think that covers most of the ground that we're likely to see. Yeah, it looks good from here as well. We, we generate a barcode already, so that's, that's great. From an implementation point of view, um, it, it, so if, you've got a, if you're addressing an image, is, um, is this a time limited? You know, is, is there an access? Sorry. It, is there a checksum or something in the URL that we'd recommend for it, uh, being accessed or is other kind of protection? Or is it just fine that there is a barcode somewhere? That's a good point. I've seen barcode generators where you can pass in uh, well, a URL like that and you pass the barcode number and it gives you the, the number back. So I suppose, um, I guess if there's a, if that ID is being used, what's, I suppose, what's the security risk of having one of these barcodes um, leaked because they're quite specific to a set time and a place in a session. So, I don't know. I, I presume yeah, that. I mean, it may not be any. I'm just wondering whether there, it, it should say anything about, um, it's, about it's, these URLs, or, you know, the information that goes into them, whether they might be predictable or not. You know, that just, just some implementation guidance to stop any potential breaches or misuses. Sh sure. Um, I presume, um, sure that you, um, you you include the barcode in the email. Is that a URL uh, to a, a server somewhere, or is it just an attachment in the email? I think it is just a font, which if you're looking into, let's say, your iPhone, it will just render it as a barcode. Oh, okay. Fair enough. So it's actually embedded in the email itself. Yeah, it's embedded. Uh, although we do have people come sometimes complain, like iOS did an update to their operating system, and uh, so the barcode stopped displaying. So we had to change our email format. So things like this happen, but this is what I think we do: just embed it inside the email. 
and then user just print this out uh, of his phone and then take the paper and swipe it on the gate. Yeah, got it. Okay, so I guess, yeah, most times we, that's all embedded so we don't have the same sort of problem we're talking about here. We can add a sentence underneath just so to- So how would it work from the integrator point of view? So if, I think because I was hoping that we would just return them a barcode and it is up to the integrator how they present it to the user. Either create a link or just embed it in an email or whatever they want to do. So from legend perspective, we'll just when the booking is confirmed, when the order is confirmed, we'll just return a list of barcodes, valid barcodes. Yes, yeah, so you have a choice here. You could, I mean, I presume, I, I, I don't know what you think about this in terms of standard practice, Lee, but you could put a base64 encoded image URL in the URL of the access token, uh, which would be similar to what yeah. browsers do. Um, or you could you could include the barcode number as the the second example on the screen and, and allow the broker to render that. So I suppose either of those. Yeah, yeah, I think second probably will work for us. The second, so they, they would render that, this, yeah. that extension point. Yeah, we just return it to them and uh, based on where the user is coming from, if it's coming from an iOS device or Android or, or, a, or a website, so the integrator will handle it on their side how to present to the user. So uh, this code type, is this a standard list of uh, barcode types? Uh, yes. Uh, well, it's, well, it's not currently specified in here, but there is such a thing that exists. It's not, um, it's not entirely clear to me uh, how standardized that stuff is from the quick research I did online. Um, because the, uh, although the code type is used, is that, so I mean, legend would generally use one code type. All their, all their customers would have the same scanners in place that would accept that code type. Um, but there is other variables to use as well, like width and height and spacing that all goes into determining what that looks like. So the idea with this being an extension point at the minute is that it won't, we don't get tripped up if we haven't thought it all through and it saves us going into the, you know, detail of trying to understand how that all works right now. Um, yeah. At this point. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, that, so yeah, now I'm thinking about because you said that there's width and height issues. Whether there should be something in in here or in the image based or the extension point to say the broker needs to think about that that the images are suitable for you know the barcodes are displayed suitable for scanning, etc. Yep, definitely. You can have a sentence about that. Just uh, just saying. Basically, make sure that you you uh, include enough information that the broker can successfully replicate the barcode on devices and in print uh, in a way that will work with the machines. Okay, but, and, but being being confident that you know the, the broker being confident that they can display barcodes being presented by a particular booking system, I guess would be part of the setup and testing that they're using. Right. Right. Absolutely. Um, okay, cool. Anything else on this? Cool. Okay. Should we jump into the next one then? That was yep. good. So reconciliation, uh, is this is another point that came up from Gladstone last week. Um, and, uh, uh, the, 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 the detail of this is basically that, um, and this is something that everyone active has previously raised um, as well, um, that when you've got um, a payment system that's working, that's obviously out of band, there are payments being taken and uh, those payments might well be deposited into, uh, for example, a Stripe account, which the um, broker owns, um, sorry, which the, uh, the ledger operator owns. And so that they can they can reconcile the payments that are in there with whatever is in the booking system that they have. Um, there needs to be a certain number of identifiers um, to do that successfully. And it seems to vary quite wildly by booking system what those identifiers actually are. It doesn't seem to be as simple as a single ID, which is then referenceable. Uh, there are things like department IDs, uh, booking IDs, activity IDs, um, site IDs, all these things uh, that, are, that are required for finance to effectively be able to, to take these two things and, and check them if there's any issues. Um, so that's that's really what this is for. And again, it's not uh, without 
without spending a lot of time on it because they were quite this is quite late in the day with 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 the making sure this is in there um the suggested approach here uh, what we've we've added in is uh it's quite a generic thing that you can then use with whatever ids are necessary so if if uh, you jump to where is that uh you might just search for uh keep going additional property i think is what you're needing to search for if you search for additional property oh that's it yeah perfect great so that's this um again a quite a generic approach um but using the property value pattern that we just uh, looked at previously for the barcodes um and this this allows you to do is include whatever it is that your system uh needs to uh to include so that you can so that the customers can do the reconciliation appropriately so site id department id this kind of thing um and uh uh yeah that's the idea so so you in in the um line item so this is uh the order item again it's an item level thing you can include if it's useful and it's again optional but it's there as a um as a, a way of doing that in a consistent manner uh, every column that you want to see replicated across in, in, you know basically the expected behavior here is that if you're using I use, use stripe again as the example you would just put all of the properties in here straight into stripe so that, that you can then marry those two things together really easily um, or whatever your equivalent payment provider is basically all payments seem to come with metadata you can attach so you just attach this metadata in there um, and then that allows people to check the things uh, work with each other. A couple of issues to raise here is this is an item level and the payment is happening at an order level. So uh, there's a challenge there. One payment will need to have multiple um, uh, lots of this metadata in there potentially. Um, but, but yeah, that was, that's 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 an idea. Additional property is something that is is schema.org kind of seems to be their standard way of doing this. Um, so I have have a question thoughts. Yeah. Um, so the way this specified, it means that a broker needs to be able to store an arbitrary number of name value pairs against every order item. So as many as the booking system provides and then, I mean, it says should, but I think it would have to be a must provide them back because you presume that if they're provided, it's necessary for reconciliation. Um, so it means that, you know, on the broker side, there has to be like just a set of tags that are attached to every order item. Uh, yes, I guess it's a should only because in some cases the arrangement that the broker has with the booking system might well be different. Um, in terms of, I mean, I don't, yeah, well, who knows what their reconciliation process is, right? It could be a number of things. Um, but if they wanted to use it, in, and that would be something that they would talk about operationally when they did the in integration. Um, so, so there's a but there's a different uh, approach which puts more which puts the work back on the booking system. Which there's already a shared key, which is the UUID. So why can't the booking system attach this metadata to that shared key? I know that's for the order though, isn't it? Not the order item. But it's still, it's still achievable on the server side. If you've got uh, an ID for each order item, which I think we should have, and an ID for an order, then the extra metadata can just be on the, the back end. So uh, making it real what this reconciliation process would look like um, for someone like Everyone Active. Um, for someone like Everyone Active who use Gladstone, you can do a report from Gladstone that gives you all the bookings that have been made through a particular um, third party or broker. That, that already exists as a, as a feature. So that report means that you get all that information. And then this then says, okay, well on the other side of that, so I've got my report from Gladstone with my site IDs and my whatevers. Um, I've got my payment system and payment system has got all this other stuff in it, um, which is gonna have, it's gonna have unique IDs for the order, um, but, but having, 
shared information that you can then use to, to, to marry up the payment system with uh, what's in Gladstone, report that already exists, I suppose is the thing. And I, I guess to translate what you're saying into that would be, well, we should just have a better report from the booking system that allows you to do that reconciliation more cleanly. So rather than um, having additional data so that you can use existing reports, um, add, a, a, add a new report that you can run that just uses, has one ID, which is one, one order ID or something. And then you can, you can use that order ID to uh, match. Yeah, I mean, I don't know enough about the internals of the reporting of all of the different platforms. It's just, it, it all comes down to where, where the data, you know, what's, what's the minimum required on both sides in order to do the reconciliation. And so far, I thought we covered that by just having shared identifiers. Because the, because the broker is not going to do anything with this information other than store everything that is provided and then be prepared to give all of that back. Absolutely. That's right. But it's information that the, I would expect that the booking system will have already stored as well. Somewhere it's going to have to have um, for this UUID, this item ID, here's all the metadata in order to be able to do the reconciliation. Mm. So what, why isn't the UUID and the, the order item number enough to just remove the need to kind of pass around the, all of that extra metadata? It simplifies the, the data model on the broker side. I feel like we might well need to talk to some operational people from some of these leisure operators to probably get to the bottom of that, in fairness. Um, I guess that's, well, maybe I could ask, I mean, because um, we've been talking about Gladstone, but I don't know if, uh, of show from your perspective in legend how, how did if you if you people are, uh, are doing reconciliation with their bank account do you know what identifiers they use well as far as i know currently we just use a transaction id uh, and just to marry the two systems at the moment the transaction id will be attached to the booking or maybe more than one booking will share the same transaction ID. They're part of the same order. Uh, okay. So this is what I think we use currently. This what you're describing over there probably more uh, looks like some kind of internal operation for the admins to like like accounting system where they can move the payment or link the payment to multiple kind of accounts. This is what it looks like. And maybe, maybe going forward, we some of our customers may want a similar thing, uh, but I don't see any value of uh, exposing it to the outside system. Mm. Because for the broker point of view, it's just a payment. Uh, and uh, if you have to attach a payment with multiple, let's say, GL accounts or things like this, that would be in internal to the booking system. Yeah, sure. Uh, okay. Um, Okay, so it sounds like it's for, for a legend there is already a transaction ID which seems very similar to the order ID that we've already got here. So um, I guess it's more a question on, on the Gladstone side. I, 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 I'm, I guess, Bill, you're probably in the same situation with this where we need more time to come back and maybe even talk to some of the Gladstone customers about this. I think Phil's dropped off. Oh, Phil dropped off. I don't know if Ian, you were able to represent there, or? Uh, not an area I'm much about to do, but very quick. Yeah, it's something, to Some, yeah, something that we'd have to um, look at in more detail, I think, like you say. Yeah, OK, no problem. Um, OK, OK, sorry, Phil's just come back and as if by magic. Um, so, uh, sure. Uh, I, can, I mean, I can, I can try the question with the uh, Phil as well, if you're, I mean, Phil, do you happen to know anything about the, um, uh, how, re how reconciliation, like how, what reports uh, are available in Gladstone and, and, and what you can run to reconcile against, or is that again something we'll have to come back to, do you think? Sorry, my, uh, my computer just blue screen. I've only just literally stepped back into this conversation. <laughs> I've just missed the last five minutes. <laughs> right, um, okay. We were just, we were just talking about um, the, uh, how you do reconciliation, uh, basically, um, the bookings that are made are uh, made within the Gladstone system and then the, the an external payment provider that's being used and making sure that those two can be reconciled by an everyone active or a fusion or whoever um, 
and I just wondered if you had any any um, any idea about whether um, the uh, reconciliation could be done based on an ID that was a bit more basic than having the site ID, department ID, and these other IDs in there. Or well, honestly, off, off the top of my head, I don't know the answer to that. It's something I'd have to take away and uh, and look into. Sure, sure. I don't thought that. Yeah, no problem. So we'll. Um, yeah, it might be worth revisiting that, and maybe maybe also asking. Again, it sounds like it's more of an operational thing with some of these operators. Mm. So we can we, we can pick that up. Um, Jamie, you were going to say something. Sorry, I cut you off there. Yeah, I just um, it would sound sensible to have a kind of single source of truth because um, I've um, you know in our time we've interacted with a few different finance teams and. Um, We've tried a system where uh, we manage the reconciliation data before, um, and the problem is is maintaining that database uh, and if anything changes, making sure that they let us know has always been quite a difficult task. Um, so it would make sense to have it managed on the software side, I guess, that the operator has access to, um, rather than on the broker side where um, the operator might be dealing with multiple brokers and having to maintain multiple databases. So in this scenario we're talking about, um, so let's say my local pitch integrated um, with everyone active, um, then it, uh, how would you currently, um, so they, they have a, they, they would be, a, there'd be a Stripe account everyone active would own, the money would be deposited into there um, and then uh, I suppose that what this is saying is that that when you when you put the money in there on the Stripe account, you would put these IDs against it so they can re do the reconciliation on their side to make sure they're being paid for everything that's being transacted on. Oh, um, so we no. So when we put the money in their Stripe account, we would include the reference um, for that booking, uh, and we'd also include metadata so like the venue, sport, format, time, and date. Um, but the actual financial reconciliation data, which can be quite complex depending on the operator uh, and the finance requirements, um, can just be a, a whole different kettle of fish. Um, so um, what, what tends to happen for us is that we supply you know, a separate report that just summarizes the, the bookings, but that's done outside of the integration, that's done um, you know, just directly between us and the the operator and our kind of relationship manager, um, and then they would make the re reconciliation based on, uh, I guess, the, the the kind of reference um, number from the transaction as it goes into Stripe. Uh, the reference number from the transaction as it goes into Stripe. So you're taking yeah. the Stripe reference number, putting it back in, storing it in my local pitch, and then providing that to them alongside the transactions. Um, yeah, yes. I'm trying to think if there are cases where we get a reference number as a confirmation from the booking system. Um, so when the booking is confirmed, they pass us a reference number, which we then put into Stripe, or uh, vice versa. Sorry, I think that's it. So we get, yeah, um, rewind a bit. We get the charge ID from Stripe when the payment has been successful, and then we put that into the booking system. Perfect. And that that is actually already supported by this spec, actually. Yeah. I think in, as the only thing that you you post back. That was one of the yeah. uh, requests. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So they can then reconcile the payments with the. Um, uh, uh, the charge IDs in, uh, in Stripe, the payments and charge IDs in Stripe and the, the um, fields in the uh, Sure. If you go, um, uh, Lee, if you go up slightly in the spec, uh, I think it's just above, is it just above that? Um, yes, a payment ID. So the, the previous sentence to that section is basically saying, um, without an example, unfortunately, but it does say, in all cases, cases, a payment identifier must be uniquely resolvable. So this is basically exactly what you just said there. Um, a payment ID is given uh, to the booking system based on whatever happened in, in Stripe or wherever it is, and that must be uniquely resolvable for audit purposes. So without this section, 
So I, I think what might be best to do, um, because this requirement is really, I think this is more an everyone action specific thing. Um, we, um, and, and I understand Fusion have a similar thing. So we, we probably just need to talk to those guys and figure out whether, as you say, uh, Jamie, that's sufficient and we don't need this section, or if, if we do need this section, maybe we need to drill in a little bit closer to what exactly it looks like and, and how that works with the Gladstone system. Yeah, that sounds good. But I mean, because, because we said that reconciliation is out of scope, we just need to be making sure that everyone is comfortable that the, the current identifiers are sufficient. Yes. If, if we've got a unique identifier for an order and an order item, and the payment identifier, then I, I, I'm, I'm struggling to see what else wouldn't already be available and stored on the booking system side. I totally agree, Lee. In, 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 in concept, I totally agree. I think it's just the reality of what reports are coming out of the systems and, and what they're currently using. So maybe that's, but it might just be the case of just adding a report, for example, rather than trying to, um, as you say, overcomplicate all of this. Okay. Yeah, um, yeah okay. Um, so yeah, let's let, we'll, we'll we'll see if we can take that to the, to these guys. Um, okay, refund behaviour. Um, now I have to just check quickly get my notes of what that was about. Uh, I think that is. And that's related to the. Um, there was a question around two-phase commits and orders. Yeah, absolutely, two-phase commits. So, yeah, so if we go to, um, so that we had a bit of a, a debate, um, and again, uh, it's a shame that um, I did I did see if we could get Pete back into this call, because I know that it was him that raised it initially, and obviously it's going to be difficult to debate this if he's not here to defend the point, but we'll, um, we'll never endeavour to try it, as we do. Um, so uh, this is about the cancellation process. If you go to cancellations um, and just, just really getting a sense of whether the two-phase commit is actually necessary here. So cancelled after B, that's right, yeah. Uh, and there should be a little diagram, this is it. So if you go down to the diagram, right. Okay, so the exam question here is for cancellations specifically. Um, the two approaches we have here are of what's what's in front of us um, and there's a github issue all about this but I'll summarize it so um, in front of us here is a two-phase commit approach which basically means I want to cancel a thing I put forward uh, a cancellation request and say I would like to cancel this and it will come back and respond with yes you can and this is how much money you'll expect back when you complete that request which allows for um, we might have talked about this in the previous call, I think Shoaib said something about um, what, what happens if we have um, uh, a deal where you've got three for the price of two, how does that all work? And so one of the advantages of the approach where you say, I want to do this cancellation request, and it's, it gives you an idea when you do that, what, what's possible is that you can present that to the user and you can give them a definitive answer um, as to what they'll expect, and then they commit the actual uh, cancellation then they then they go forward forward with it and and they know exactly what to expect that's the one um, side uh, of, the, of the argument and the other side of the argument is that we don't need two phases we can get away with one phase um, and we can make a set of assumptions or sorry assertions about what happens in a cancellation that mean that we don't need to check because we can basically based on what we can see in uh, certain other properties we can infer what will happen. Um, and so in this um, uh, mode, if you go down, Lee, sorry, slightly, there's an issue. If you could just click the link in that issue. Uh, the uh, top one, I think. Allow whole order cancellation. Maybe. Well, but one of those two issues has got a shed load of content in it. <laughs> so whichever one it is. Um, is that the one? No, there's a separate issue, I think, for two phase refunds. Okay. Maybe it's not linked. I mean, you know the one I'm talking about. Yeah. I thought it was. Arbitrary refunds are not in scope, maybe? I think it's that one that you've got there. Third down. Maybe. 
No. Mm. Try, try far down. Yeah, this is it. Keep going down to the bottom of this one. Right there, it is. Actually, sorry, up, up a sec. Let's just, I'll just read out Pete. Let's go. Let's go through what Pete's suggestion is. Uh, up a bit. There you go. Those three. So Pete's three options suggested. This is the Club Spark system. So um, cancel without refund, cancel require refund, and cancel attempt refund. Um, and uh, basically, the the idea here is that when you you have a flag that says I'm going to do this, I'm going to assert this kind of refund, and then it will succeed or fail on that basis. So you would assert, I'm going to cancel without a refund, and if that's allowed, it will then succeed or fail, or you assert, I want to cancel requiring a refund, and then it will uh, succeed or fail. If you can't get a refund, it will fail, or you can cancel attempt refund, and basically it will succeed whether a refund is possible or not in that case. Um, and uh, and it, what this means is you don't need two phases because you're effectively advertising. Well, you're, you don't even need to advertise it. You can just... Um, you can just make the call with one of those options and then it will, it will happen or it won't. Um, so this is an alternative to two phases, which slightly simplifies it. Um, but it does mean that the behavior is, is slightly different because you don't get a, you, you're not in a situation where you can advertise to the user a cancel button and when they click it, tell them what options are available. You've got to just basically decide what you want to do um, and then it will either work or it won't. So it's the other way around. Have I explained that? Maybe I haven't explained that very well. So, so, the, so the, two, the two options are, so I'll try that again, the two options are, um, when you press cancel, you can get something that comes back from the booking system to say, this is what's possible. So i.e. you can get refunded, click here to continue, or you won't get a refund, click here to continue, whatever it is. That's option one. Option two is you can uh, you don't you don't have that first step. You just the booking the, the broker makes a decision about what it wants to ask for. You say so you press the cancel button and then it will come back saying sorry you can't cancel. There's no refund possible. So it doesn't it just doesn't let you do it at all. Um, or uh, you press it and it says yes you've got a refund you've got a full refund. Um, So you, you you don't yeah so you, you you cancel regardless of the consequences effectively in that in that scenario. Um, so really, the difference is whether you know you're going to get a refund or not. Uh, yes, whether you know you're going to get a refund or not. That's it. So you could. You isn't, could hmm. is it, isn't advertising that separate to whether you want a two phase commit, which. Uh, well, whether a first call, a, a first status call of some sort that indicates the result, however it is, two-phase or whatever, um, some notion of a way that you can query the booking system to see what will happen if you press the button is the first option. The second option is you don't need to query the booking system because you don't care as long as you can press the button. Um, that will be enough. I don't know about others. I'm, I'm, I'm struggling to kind of get my head around the, what the difference is. Uh, okay, so um, probably could have illustrated this. So if you've got a, if you've got the the first option, you imagine you press the cancel button and it comes back and says uh, it's a five pound booking. You'll you you if you press cancel, you'll get a full refund and uh, your booking will be cancelled, you press confirm. That's step one, that's the, the approach number one. Approach number two is um, you have a cancel button, you press it and it says, uh, um, a, a little, say, a little thing pops up and says, by pressing cancel, um, uh, cancellation is only possible if you get a full refund, do you want to continue? And you press yes, and then it does it. And it then says, sorry, we couldn't complete because you weren't able to get a full refund. Um, or you say, or a witness pops up saying, cancellation will complete uh, whether or not you get a refund. Do you want to continue? And you say yes, and it goes ahead, and you might find out you didn't get a refund when it finishes. 
um, that's all option two. So, so what, do, what do systems actually do at the moment, separate to what the API is presenting? What, how do, are those choices given to people at the moment? Um, what's the common UX patterns here? Question, Jamie's gonna say he doesn't handle refunds. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so um, this for us is definitely a, a nice to have, but refunds can be quite a complex task, so we don't, do automated refunds at the moment. We would always check with the operator um, about the status and the ability to issue a refund. Yeah, manually. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, Show up. What, what about Legend? What's the situation in Legend? Do you know? Well, I think option one that you describe is probably more sensible because. Uh, because the the booking system legend will have to decide whether you are allowed a refund or not or whether you can even cancel in the first place so all the rules are actually then exist in the legend and we just return a couple of flags and the the integrator just displays the those flags onto the user and some message uh, uh, text message to the user so it just hides all the complexity uh, from the integrator and uh, all the business logic exists in legend so and this is what we actually currently do as well with uh, some of our products so we control all the business rules. So it sounds like I, I understood that uh, a simple get request to, to get what the current state of the order and order items, which gives those flags and then the ability to just be able to cancel is covers. Yep. Yeah. yeah. If one of the flags uh, comes back from our system to allow cancellation uh, with refund or allow cancellation with no refund, or credit note or whatever those flags are so, so that UI is uh, just uh, done based on the flags. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. That makes sense. And so, and just so I, I check, I understand how that will, that will work all the way through. So if you have a, a two items in an order and one is one that's possible to refund and one it's, it's, it's not possible. I suppose that you would then error, uh, if you tried to refund something that wasn't possible to refund, you would error the whole cancellation uh, and you would have to try again. Is that, would that be right? Uh, well, that is an issue over here about either uh, allowing user to cancel the whole uh, order or uh, just individual bookings. Because normally what we do is that uh, we don't have a concept of order in Legend. Uh, I mean, it exists at the, at the database level, but uh, not on the to, to the end user level. So user has made three bookings, and he comes and say, "I want to cancel booking number two. So we just so we work on the uh, booking uh, order item level uh, after the booking has been made. So so that is the thing. How are we gonna present it to the user in this workflow? It's probably better to do it at order item level. So user is looking at his, all of his booking coming up. He picks one of it, regardless of which order it was in, and then say, just cancel it. And let's say Legend, given the booking ID to Legend, and Legend tells you whether it's uh, you can refund or not, or cancel or not. So, so during cancellation, I don't know whether order ID is relevant, other than just uh, as a flag. Okay, that's interesting. So we might, we might need to pass a GET request, which you pass in multiple order item IDs, or uh, we make lots of get requests, I guess, uh, to, to, to check, um, as I was just thinking whether, so you, you probably ideally want to just do one call, uh, I guess, which has for, for implementation point of view, the, the simple thing is for, for us to just work on item level during cancellation. Uh, because with order, if depending upon what kind of items are in the order, a class booking or a course booking or sports course, like things can get very complex at the order level. So at item level from implementation point of view, it's very easy for us. But again, it's about uh, about the user requirements. So what are the, what is the scope of this uh, whole thing over here? Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. I think the funny thing is we had it at item level uh, and a few weeks ago we changed it <laughs> to be order level. And the people who are arguing for that are not on this call. Um, so uh, the, the reason well, we- Well, it's possible is mm. that you just uh, have a function which says just cancel the whole order. In that instance, everything is fine. You can, you're canceling the whole order and you are just uh, returning all the money back. But if you tell a user, I want to cancel the whole book 
uh, order and uh, I mean there are five bookings or he can only cancel five four of them not the last one so this is where the things get complex uh, and then all the metadata about uh, how to return the list of flags and everything they become very complex so from implementation point of view just telling user he can only cancel a booking item is easier but again it's a part of the scope of the, this project well, I, I mean, we just we just need to be able to undo whatever we did before. I think is that is really what what this is about, just so that the cancellation is possible. I, I, we had at item level um, the reason that they um, the discussion that happened before was that that would be more complicated because if it was item level, you would need to make multiple calls to cancel multiple items, and it was decided that actually having uh, one call where you include all the IDs in it was easier because you could there, therefore make um, one. That, I think they, I think the question was, um, if you have booked, um, if you have booked to go uh, to a yoga class and you have booked a crash for your child, and you request a cancellation on the yoga class, and that succeeds, and then you request a crash cancellation and that fails, that might have changed your, uh, that might change you, what you'd have done if you'd have known that you you couldn't have completed the second one, and so. Yeah better to have them together so that if you can't cancel a crash, maybe you'll still go to the yoga class because you paid for one of them. Um, and therefore, uh, atomic cancellation was the argument that they said would be better than individual items. Mm -hmm. So when you cancel an order, is it you would cancel the whole order or just pick pick certain items? Pick certain items. So it, 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 it sounds like from your point of view, actually, you could just treat it at item level. Um, but as a transaction, so it specifies two yeah, items. From, from our point of view, once you've placed an order, the notion of order just disappears. It's just you've booked multiple bookings and user can just work on those bookings. So things are very different in our case. Sure. But you, you, will, you will still have an association between those individual order items and the order though. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, at the back end we do, yeah, but we don't present it to the uh, member. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so um, slightly diff that's, that's actually a slightly different question, isn't it? But it sounds like whether with the gets, um, because effectively if you're doing a get for a particular pair of things you want to cancel, you're then not doing, it's not order based anymore. Um, like you say, for the business, for this to be complete, the business logic should be entirely in legend. So maybe if we take that as the the requirement here, and then we can go away and think about how we we do that. So we want the business logic to be in legend as as much as possible. We want a loose association between items and orders, so that you don't necessarily have to store all that state if you don't need to. Um, yeah. And and we want it to be atomic from the previous conversation, so that. Um, a, a parent and their child with two different events will succeed and fail in, in cancellation together. What, what, where's the complexity in being able to do a get on an order and get the ref, being able to see the kind of cancellation or refund status for the individual items? Um, is, is it just because that you might have to do n calculations as opposed to one? Yeah, I think probably yes. Uh, so, so if the order is very complex, uh, you've got as Nick earlier uh, said that. Uh, uh, yes, there is the number of uh, items in the order. You have to do very long list of uh, calculations. Yeah, it's, it's around that thing. Yeah. So, so working from a, on an individual item is quite easy rather than the whole order. And then if once user has uh, let's say cancelled. Some uh, let's say half of the bookings from the order, and again next day comes in say, I want to cancel further. So you have to calculate all the rules all the time. So it's a it's a lengthy piece of calculation. Right, of course, yes. So I, I think yeah, and to, to um, say that in a slightly different way, it sounds like it, it's all dynamic. So if you're doing a get request on an order, you're doing a ton of dynamic calculations that depend on the the date, the time, like the how many things are in the event, what other rules are applied. Uh, so it's not a trivial task to do that, sounds like. Um, okay, 
So uh, that's really helpful. It, it basically sounds like we're saying that some, some type of thing where I don't, maybe we don't need to call it two phase, but you can basically make the minimum number of calls using what we just discussed to get the business logic's response. So basically, I want to ask the business logic that's in Legend the question, get the answer, and then based on the answer, allow the user to perform an action. Seems to be where we are. Um, so I guess we just need to look at the best form of that. Okay, so we've hit time, unfortunately, um, in terms of covering this, the, the uh, last issue around um, approvals. We haven't got time to do that today, but that's quite handy because also the two people that were really pushing for it haven't um, been able to make it. So that would save me trying to, um, to uh, do that on their behalf. But um, I, I will, um, so the next thing to, that's going on is there's a, there's a um, workshop on the 2nd of April. I know some of you guys are coming to that. Um, and we're going to be going through this at a very high level, make sure everybody's on board with the kind of the scope, the goals, the vision, all that stuff, business rationale, um, and some of the trade-offs we've made in terms of, you know, including cancellation. We won't be going into the details of whether it's one or two phase commits or anything like that. It will be more um, that cancellation is in there and, and it lets you do that. And that's just to make sure everyone's bought in. And if, if that's, hopefully um, everyone says, yeah, that's, that's exactly what we need. Um, maybe a couple other things get surfaced. Um, and the idea is then that we have another call on the 10th of April. Um, and optimistically, because we, this is an optimistic plan, um, we would be able to um, finalize the last of these issues. So we'll do an iteration of what we discussed around the, the cancellations um, for them as well and combine those things. So on the 10th of April, we should hopefully be in a position where we've taken the feedback from the workshop. There might be a high level and if there's anything massive that changes, we might need to revisit all of this plan. But if everyone's okay with the high level with what's included, um, then uh, we can take those changes on the 10th of April. We can, we can look at them and, and hopefully be in a position where we've got something pretty close to a, to a, a releasable thing. Um, and, and I mean, I guess the point to note here is that people have come and gone from these calls for, um, and the people who are watching this in the catch up afterwards will know as well. Uh, we've been doing this for over a year now. And um, I guess at some point we have to kind of draw a line under it and say, let's just have a go. And um, we've, we've, we've accounted for as many of the things as we can. And in, no doubt during implementation, we're going to have more, uh, more things that come out. Um, but I guess the main thing is just getting this, uh, getting this over the line. So. Um, yeah. Um, so in terms of process over the next few weeks, so we'll obviously try and surface any general concerns or gather feedback at the workshop. Um, I think for those of you that are planning to, to run through the spec again or for the first time, getting um, early feedback on anything that you have concerns about would be good. So, um, you know, uh, seeing issues as they occur rather than kind of waiting a few weeks until you've done a complete run through would be helpful. Um, so, you know, go ahead, uh, file stuff in, in GitHub. We have, there is a, a link in the spec. There's a whole GitHub repo, repo for um, capturing issues. It's a good way for us to carry on discussions in between these meetings. You can see that there's a, quite a few that are where we flagged for community feedback. Um, we need to get to a point where we're confident that either we've addressed these um, sufficiently for 1.0 uh, or where we need, we know we need to do more work in order to get, uh, get it over the line. So people's um, attention to, uh, to the issues, um, if we're asking you for feedback um, or if we mail, uh, send emails to the mailing list, um, you know, asking for feedback, if you can, um, try and keep up to date so that we can try and get this over the line, that would be appreciated. Sometimes it can even just be doing a thumbs up on a comment on GitHub to say, you're happy with what we're proposing. It doesn't have to be a long kind of uh, feedback, just saying, yes, I'm comfortable with this as a decision will help us kind of trade off sometimes, well, sometimes slightly competing viewpoints, um, just so that we can get something that people are comfortable with. So, um, yeah, so we're, we're out of time. So hopefully uh, those of you who can come along on the second are already signed up. Well, I think the, um, the Eventbrite link, I think it's been circulated. So take a look um, and sign up if you haven't already. Uh, and then we'll speak again on the 10th. So thanks again for your time.
Great. Thanks, guys. Really appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Cheers for your work. Bye-bye. Thank you, man.